didn't even put food on the table, and they lived on a farm. Hiram didn't mind it much because by 1843, when he was 10 years old, he had a hobby. He liked to go back behind the old broken down barn and look up at the glorious stars. He wanted to know everything there was to know about the stars. So he went and asked the, the teacher at his school. It was one of those old little house on the prairie, one room schoolhouses and they did have a teacher, and she didn't know anything about astronomy at all. But she told him that there was this place that he could go. It was called the university. And at the university, they knew everything there was to know about the stars. When he ran home that night and told his parents they greeted his eagerness with sadness because they were poor and they knew that sons of poor pig farmers did not go to places like the university. But at that moment, the old story goes that they looked into his eyes and they saw a glimmer, a gleam, a spark in those eyes that made them know for a certainty that someday their son Hiram was going to be somebody. So they script and they save that indeed some days they did without meals so that Hiram would have a few dollars in his pocket when he went to a tiny little liberal arts college about three miles up the road here <laughs> called Ohio Wesleyan University, which by the way is a very fine university. You should send your children or grandchildren there when they graduate from high school. There I got the plug in. I feel much better. Hiram turned out to be an excellent, excellent student. In fact, when he was graduated, which is the way we put it here at Ohio Wesleyan, when he was graduated in 1857, he was at the top of his class. Now his class only had 12 people in it. Did I mention it was a very small university? <laughs> but he was at the top, so they did something they didn't do much then, and they don't do it all now. They hired him right with that bachelor's degree to begin to teach mathematics and science at Ohio Wesleyan University, which I am told he did very well. He was one of those stand and deliver kind of teachers, as many young teachers are, until 1862, when in 1862, Hiram Perkins surprised everyone, the people he surprised the most were, of course, his parents, when he decided to quit his job and do something else. And I'm sure everyone in the room knows what was happening in these not-so-United States in 1862 that might cause a young man in the flower and strength of his youth to quit his job to do something else. And what was it? No. The Civil War, that's right. And Hiram Perkins wanted to serve his country as a soldier in that war because, above all things, Hiram Perkins was a gentleman, but there was one thing that he could not abide, and that was the institution of slavery. In fact, he helped to found our little underground railway station up here just off Sandusky Street in Delaware, Ohio, and himself may have guided slaves, former slaves, northward to Canada and freedom over this very ground. So he went to the old recruiting depot, which was right up here. There's a cemetery now where the Delaware contingent of the Union Army was bivouacked to try to join the Union Army, but they wouldn't let him in because he was too skinny. He was, I am not making this up, I have documentary evidence to prove this, he was either 6'2", 
6 feet 1 or 6 feet 4, and he either weighed 97 or 110 pounds. He was, in other words, a stick. His students compared him to a praying mammoth. <laughs> they were afraid he would get in the tent before the battle and die from exposure. So, Hiram Perkins, and with some sadness, decided that he would serve his country anyway, in what way he could, so he took a leave of absence from being a teacher at Ohio Wesleyan, went back to his family farm, which had now moved, uh, farm, which had now moved from Zanesville, Ohio, to Marietta, Ohio, the first farm having gone bankrupt, and raised pigs for his country. What? Well, yeah, I know, you can't ride a pig into battle, but I bet if you were one of the quarter of a million soldiers in General George McClellan's Army of the Potomac and you got a hold of a pig, I bet you could figure out what to do with it, right? What? Yeah. Eat it, that's right. Now, in those days, they converted pork, pig meat, into salt pork a rather vile-tasting version of the meat. In this case, the story goes that the meat was so hard and so dense that they did not give them knives to cut the meat. They gave them saws. <laughs> but Hiram Perkins was an excellent teacher. He was an even better hog farmer, and he sent barrel after barrel of salt pork to the Union Army, and, in fact, toward the end of the war, was one of only three farmers in the northern states to be given special permission to send salt pork to the south to help. With the privation there, mm -hmm. such was the man he was. So that, by the end of the war, Hiram Perkins had served his country, and oh yes, by the way, he was rich beyond the dreams of avarice. Certainly rich beyond the dreams of the son of poor pig farmers. He had $83,000 in the bank, which was a lot of money in 1865, and so he had a choice to make. He could either buy himself a big house and live the life of a gentleman farmer for the rest of his life, or he could go back to his low-paying job teaching math and science at Ohio Wesleyan University. By the way, any teachers in the crowd? Only teachers will appreciate his salary at the time. He was making the princely sum of $400 a year, which was considered a low salary even in those days. So, can you guess which one he did? Well, of course, he went back to teaching. For one thing, Hiram Perkins believed that teaching was the most important thing a human being could do in life. A sentiment we happen to share here at Ohio Wesleyan and Perkins Observatory. But he had another reason, which people made a big deal of at the time, but it's really a very simple reason. Hiram Perkins felt guilty. He had seen the photographs of the battlefields after the battle. He had seen the bodies strewn so densely that you could walk across a battlefield and not touch the ground. And he swore that he would not profit from the death and suffering of others. So the money went into the bank and into investments. Hiram Perkins never spent a single penny of the hog money, as we have lovingly come to call it, as he went back to a long career teaching now mostly mathematics and astronomy at Ohio Wesleyan University. And 42 years pass. It's now 1907, and now time for old Hiram Perkins to retire. And the old story goes 
that he went to commencement, as we like to call it, to see his last student go off into the world, went home, sat down at his rickety old writing desk, wearing his suit. He had a suit, an old frock coat. He bought a new suit every 10 years, whether he needed one or not. They say of the suit that he wore that you could walk up behind him, pat the tails of his old coat, and a great cloud of chalk dust would rise up around him. And in the image of him teaching, you'll see in the hall, you can see that it is encrusted with chalk dust. That suit, that last suit that he taught in, actually had patches sewn on one elbow and one knee, sewn lovingly by his long-suffering wife. Obviously, Hiram Perkins was saving every penny that he could because he had a plan in mind. And so he reached out from that rickety old writing desk, picked up a yellowed piece of paper, hit himself on the top of the head like this and said, oh my goodness, I have a lot of money in the bank. The 83000 had expanded to almost a quarter of a million dollars. And at that moment, the old story goes that Hiram Perkins remembered that a promise that he had made to himself when he was, quite literally, a starving student at Ohio Wesleyan, that if he ever had a few dollars, he'd build a little or buy a little telescope so that the students at Ohio Wesleyan would have something they could use to look up at the stars. Ah, but he had already built that little telescope. We see it to this very day up on the Ohio Wesleyan campus. It is called, in honor of that goal, the Student Observatory. But now Hiram had, for a guy who took his lunch to work every day in a burlap sack and used the same burlap sack over and over again because he didn't want to waste another sack. <laughs> to a parsimonious old coot as he was, with a plan in his head, that was not a quarter of a million dollars. It was all the money in the world to build not by the third largest telescope in the world and plunk it down on a little hilltop three miles south of the university that had given his life meaning and purpose and joy oh those many many years trouble was of course that nobody in the United States knew how to build such a telescope. No one knew or had the optical skills to grind and polish the giant telescope mirror to exacting standards. So Hiram Perkins sent opticians from, of all places, the U.S. Bureau of Standards to Europe to steal, I mean to learn, the technology of telescope mirror making. Unfortunately, they were there a long time. A little war came along called World War I, the Great War, that kept them there so that it wasn't until 1923 when Hiram Perkins was 90 years old that he stood on this very spot. He had a little shovel in his hand as he bent over very feebly and very frailly to dig out the first clump of dirt to begin to build his great dream. Mm. And eight months passed. His wife had died just a few months before and Hiram Perkins 
in that grief and that loss and that old age himself was finally dying. He lay in his bed. He could barely lift his arm. He spoke only in a thin and raspy voice. But in that voice, you could barely hear to anyone who came close enough to hear. He expressed his last wish to just once look through that telescope that if truth be told, he had dreamed his whole life since he was that 10-year-old kid behind the barn of building. Trouble was, he couldn't get up on his own, <clears throat> so his friends, all except for his sister Carolyn, had expired before him in his family, so his friends picked him up by the arms and the legs, and they carried him out to a little horse and buggy, and they bumped and jolted their way down a tiny little one-and-a-half lane dirt and gravel road that we now call a Route 23, the old Columbus Pike. And when they got to the bottom of the hill here, they discovered that the construction road from down there to up here was much too rutted and bumpy for Hiram Perkins to take the last few steps in his long, long journey of life. So his friends picked him up by the arms, and they propped him up by the side of the road, and in the distance he saw the half-completed silver dome gleaming in the noonday sun. It was all he ever saw in the place. They took him back home, put him in his bed, facing a window, so that at night he could see the stars, and there he lingered for two solid months, getting weaker and weaker until one fine night, just after midnight, with the stars shining in the sky. Hiram Perkins, as he would have put it, went to his reward. Hiram Perkins died. You think that's a sad story? It is not. I dream for you and for your children and their children what Hiram Perkins found. That one true thing to do with his life that gave it meaning and purpose and joy. He lived a long and happy life. There is one thing that we can regret, that Hiram Perkins did not live to see the astronomers come. And those astronomers came from all over the world to perch themselves, as some of you just saw, 50 feet above the ground on a rickety metal observing platform to begin, as Hiram Perkins loved to say, his favorite phrase, to explore the mysteries of the cosmos. Gets pretty late up there in the dark, a dark that is sometimes on a moonless night so deep that you cannot see your hand perched on your nose. But it isn't the darkness that gets to you. It's the quiet. It's the silence. A quiet so complete and so profound that sometimes the only sound 
that you can hear is the sound of your own beating heart. And in their loneliness and their isolation, late, late at night, in the quiet of the dome, those astronomers began to hear things. They began to hear the squeaks and groans and moans and pounding noises. What was that? That come on now, as you know, are probably just the signs of an old, old building slowly settling into the ground, slowly settling into time. But they say, oh yes, they do. They say that the ghost of Hiram Perkins haunts this observatory that late, late at night, under the dim glow of these beautiful old brass reading lamps, he takes the books off the shelf, reads them, leaves them for us to find in the morning. You know, come to think of it, someone will find this one in the morning. <laughs> and they say his spirit cannot rest. They say that just once he'd like to climb the stairs that some of you just climbed, just once perch himself 50 feet above the ground, just once look through that telescope that he had dreamed his whole life of building. Of course, he can't. He's dead! <laughs> You don't believe in ghosts, do you? I think I can say this with some certainty because some of these people are here. If you go the world round and look for the biggest nerds, geeks, and propeller heads on the planet, you'll find them right here at Perkins <laughs> Observatory. Or to put it another way, rationalists to the ends. So we do not believe in ghosts. But we do believe in spirits and we do believe that the spirit of Hiram Perkins is with us here in everything we do. Because they took him back home, they put him in his bed and as he lay dying in that thin raspy voice you could barely hear. He rewrote his will. He left a few dollars to his sister Carolyn. She eventually saved that money and left it to Perkins Observatory. The rest Hiram left as an endowment to Perkins Observatory to help keep the place open over the years. Such was his commitment to the place. He only asked two things of us. One was to leave his old family Bible here at the observatory for you to see and be inspired by. It is open to his favorite passage, the one that he asked us to inscribe above the doorway of Perkins Observatory. We put his name there instead. But the passage, Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. Any biblical scholars in the crowd? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, the sky, showeth his handiwork. Just what do you think that an old Methodist astronomer's favorite passage was B. The second thing he asked us to do was to have two public programs every single month so that folks like you could come and perhaps see the beauty of the place and perhaps on one of those rare clear nights use the telescope to look up at the stars. This program, all together, will, mm, slow month, we'll only have 15 or 20 programs. 
and I say this from my heart, every one of those programs is for Hiram Perkins, but every one of them is for you too. Because Hiram wrote in his will that yes, he wanted to create a place where, quote him, astronomers may go and explore the mysteries of the cosmos. There's that favorite phrase again. But he also said that he wanted to create a place where people could go and, to quote him again, experience the glory of God through the glory of God's creation the universe, so that every time somebody like you comes and sees the craters on the moon, and every time somebody like you comes and sees the rings of Saturn, and every time somebody like you comes and sees oh, a telescope field filled with 100 thousand stars, we believe with all of our hearts that the spirit of Hiram Perkins is here. Now, of course, that spirit is the spirit of the guy who created a great place for us to hang around in and maybe set up our telescopes on the front lawn. But it's more than that. It's the spirit of a man who started out as a student and then a professor at a place like that up there at Ohio Wesleyan and built a place like this. And to ask anyone who's been to a place like that or lived at a place like this and they will tell you that if your heart is pure and your attitude is right, it's just a short hop from a place like that or a place like this, ad astra, upward to the stars. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now why they call them frock coats. <laughs> <laughs> they are frocks.